Okay, so hi everybody and thanks for joining me on this stage today. So I'm very glad to be opening the session with you. And well, and very glad for this event. So I was at the first uh, edition of the event, which was great. So I'm sure this one will be even better. And this morning I'm going to speak about how you can survive uh, in the dark forest of Web3. So this needs, uh, there are a few concepts here that need to be defined. So concepts of Web3 and dark forest. And I'm going to run uh, into that a bit uh, in a bit. So what I will be talking about, I'll be talking about the different web free security risks. Um, what can we do today to protect assets and basically uh, the fight we have, which is a persistent fight between security and user experience. And usually user experience is not winning. Um, the risks that are specific to NFTs, uh, because I think that the main way today people are introduced to web free, so it's still interesting to talk about this. But this can be generalized to everybody who wants to create content and who is not a crypto geek, basically. Um, specific risks so we have for this and what can we expect in the future. So it will be fairly technical, but I will try to keep it entertaining for, for everybody during this half half an hour. So who am I? Uh, I'm a technical co-founder at Ledger. Uh, so I created the company along with eight other people and I brought the smart card technology to Ledger. So because Ledger is based on French technology of smart card that you have in your wallet. And we just generalized that to think that, well, it was a good way to secure our crypto assets. Um, today I'm running the Innovation Lab, which is uh, a place at Ledger where we think about the future and what we could be implementing in the next uh, couple of years. Um, so I am an architect myself, I build things, uh, and I reverse engineer things, which means that I like to break things to understand how they work and to rebuild them better. So it's, it's, um, it's a good skill to have in that field, I would say. And at Ledger, I would say to summarize that I am helping to keep things open and decentralized. Uh, now about the presentation, so Web3 and the Dark Forest. Um, so First, maybe we want to define Web3 because the concept is very, is very well, it's not very clear for today. It's more like an umbrella marketing world. Uh, I would say it's a bit like saying that the cloud is, the cloud is not your computer. Uh, I can summarize Web3 by a combination of three different things uh, connected together. So a self-sovereign user, a user owning keys and able to make transactions, uh, a website, and to connect those two things together, a web application. So the decentralized application will be running on a blockchain, uh, which means that everything that you are doing here can be observed. And since everything that you are doing can be observed, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good parallel to make with, uh, well, uh, a concept that was introduced by Liu Sixchin, uh, who is a science, uh, science fiction author in a series of books uh, starting from the, the Free Bodies problem. I think the first one, that's the name of the first one. And that's the concept of dark forest. So without spoiling the book, uh, the concept is that, well, the universe is very um, large, but if you make noise, uh, someone will notice and we try to stalk you and then to kill you. So it might be a bit, uh, a, bit uh, um, a bit gloomy, I mean, in the morning, but the main idea about that is just to say that everybody can look at what you do on Web3. So if someone can exploit some things that you are doing, it will happen. So since you can't be silent, uh, you have to be extra careful when you are interacting with Web3 applications. And this concept has been already used for by Paradigm, I mean, back in the day. So they already made a blog post about kind of the same thing, but from a different perspective. Uh, they were looking at, they were looking at um, transactions and how people could be from trend, and I will be more talking about security on this. Um, so I will be focusing mostly on Ethereum and the EVM chains, and why? Just because that's where we have the most tools uh, to avoid problems, and because that's where we have the most applications, but the same concept can apply uh, to all chains when you have smart contracts running and on which you can transact. First concept, which is super important to understand in crypto, uh, if you don't own the keys, uh, you don't own the coins. So corollary of that is that if you lose your keys, uh, you are going to lose your coins because of course, well, there are no insurance. Uh, you can't call someone, you can't call the CEO of Ethereum to get back your keys. Uh, you just lost your money. Um, so keeping secure key backups is completely critical. There are several ways to do that. So I won't get into, into many details, but well, the way you get your key today is from a master key. 
so you have a way uh, to you have a way to restore on different wallets, and you have a way to be interoperable that way. Uh, everything is defined by a set of standards, which creates this interoperability. But here, um, the main issue is that people have to understand that that's not clear if you are not a, s a very technical user or if you are just new to that space. If you give away your mnemonic, so if you give away your seed backup, you are giving away all your assets. So. Now let's look at what a cryptocurrency transaction looks like. So to see that it's, it's really not easy when you are not into that field. So first, you will see a destination address, uh, which is not easy to read. So if you see that, you don't really know where you are sending your money. Um, then you'll see an amount. So the amount can be divided into a lot of decimals. So again, it's not super easy to read if you are reading that on a phone. If you are not used to the unit, uh, it might be confusing for people. And arbitrary data, which can be pretty much anything, but usually you can see that at a, as a function call. So it's a function call that's going to be um, written into some hexadecimal set of, uh, set of characters. Um, this function call can be translated if you're lucky into something that is a bit more clear, like for example here a function called add code hash, but it's still very technical. So you don't really understand that if you call this function, you don't see what is going to happen to your wallet and that's part of the problem. So the easiest way today you can lose your keys, if we look at the different security risk, well, it's just giving them away. Because there are a lot of people that will be out uh, for ways to, to take your keys. So one of the most, uh, one of the most classical slash stupid one, I would say, is people posing as support for different companies. Uh, for example, here you can see a tweet about uh, just someone who will answer a typical question for support on Twitter saying, okay, this guy helped me on Instagram. Because as everybody knows, I mean, you have a lot of technical support running on Instagram. So if you make the mistake of talking to that guy, uh, you will end up to a website that will give, that will ask for your memory, and then you will lose your keys. Um, so people in the space keep warning uh, users, but it's not efficient enough at the moment. Uh, and one thing which is very important to notice is that, well, it's a scam. You have a few scams that ask you for your mnemonic, but if your user experience is designed completely backward in the wrong way, uh, I'm not going to, to criticize Swiss Post here because everybody can make that. Here we have a website uh, for a stamp saying, okay, if you want to check, if you have your stamp, please enter your mnemonic phrase. And of course, you should never do that because you should never enter your mnemonic uh, phrase in any website. But here, it's part of the normal flow of the application. So, okay, you are going to do it. That way, maybe you'll be lucky. Maybe you have no malware, and you will you won't lose your assets. But most of the time, when you do that, you will lose your assets. So that's just uh, an example of how bad design can can just help you uh, losing money. <laughs> Uh, another example of, uh, of a UX pattern which doesn't help, so that just here showing that complexity can lose, uh, get users lost, and again, why user, user experience is super important. Uh, you had a way with MetaMask uh, to synchronize your desktop with your mobile, and the, what they meant by synchronizing is not clear. When you see that, you don't really understand what this is doing, and in the end, you end up giving control of your keys to your mobile when you, when you run this. So they disabled it because they realized that it was way too dangerous. Uh, and yeah, of course, well, nobody wants to run this because you, don't, you are not sure about what you're doing. And scammers will ask you for this code because they know that it is confusing. And since it's confusing, you will do it because they are going to, well, they are going to give you a lot of technical explanations that don't really make sense. And you will use your coins. So again, the easiest way of losing your coins is just to give them away. And there are a lot of creative uh, wrong user experience um, paths to end up doing that. Um, the second easiest way to lose your crypto today uh, is through the second component of Web3, so the web. Because it's very easy to attack the web, I mean, it's easier than attacking the wallet or attacking the decentralized application. Um, so you have a new class of applications that people call crypto drainers uh, that are phishing pages that will uh, make you send your crypto. So usually the masquerade as a, a, a legitimate project it will tell you, okay, you bought this NFT and then you are lucky because you can get a new one. Um, they manage to create pages that, have, that look very convincing because since uh, your account is public, it's a blockchain, uh, they can just scan your account and recognize the NFT that you have. And then they will personalize the experience to tell you, okay, you're very lucky because you have this one so you can get this other NFT with the same ID and the same rarity. And if you are not paying attention, you're going to, you're going to use this page. 
problem is this page will not uh, drop you an NFT. It will just create a transaction to send your NFT and sometimes uh, try to obfuscate it. So obfuscate it by using different contracts, different things that you are not going to pay attention to. And it might look a bit simple, but it's super effective. So just, well, for one simple, uh, one simple on a sample study, uh, more than almost 2,000 uh, ads were stolen by, by just one crypto drainer. So just to give an example, while well, those phishings are super uh, profitable for the, for the attackers. And then, well, again, an attack on the website, but which is uh, more typical, I mean, more, uh, it looks more like a typical attack on Web2, so that's not phishing, so that's, that's a real attack on that. Uh, people can manage to inject code into the UI, so code into the web part of the application, so either by hijacking the DNS or hijacking the server or hijacking Cloudflare, I mean, people are super creative. And then you are going to, use, the user is going to go to the legitimate website, but he is going to interact with different code. And you can make, again, this code very obfuscated and hard to understand. And a good example of this was what happened with Badger DAO. So Badger DAO is famous because Celsius managed to lose uh, a lot of money on that. I mean, more than, more, than 50, more than 50 millions. And it is just a UI attack. So in the end, this UI was forcing the user through a call which is not super understandable to send back the asset to the hacker. And it worked pretty well because people just thought that they were interacting with, uh, with uh, badgers, they were not paying attention to the transaction being sent, and that's it. So one single mistake and your money is gone. That's what's super important to, to remember always in Web3. Um, then, well, if we get into more sophisticated, sophisticated way of losing money, you can think about malware. So malware coming from, well, your computer can be hacked, your mobile can be hacked, there are a lot of ways to, lot of ways to do that. Uh, I would say that the current state uh, of protection against malware is not really improving. Uh, you are getting more and more attacks. I mean, some attacks can be, well, just due to the complexity of the software stack, for example. Uh, we have seen this recently with, uh, with MetaMask and Phantom, uh, when people um, made, managed to find an exploit that relied on the architecture of the Chrome extensions. Uh, but because this is buried into the browser stack, people were not paying attention, but you could lose your memory that way. Um, the mobile malware space is getting worse at a very alarming rate. So if you have been following the news, you've seen that Pegasus and so on are, well, are, have been quite famous back in the day. So usually this is not used to steal crypto, uh, but it could be, I mean, definitely, it could be weaponized to, it could be weaponized to attack crypto wallets. And you have new ways of malware today that are the most interesting, in my opinion, well, because I like security, so interesting is uh, depending on, on where you stand. Um, but hardware attacks right now can be triggered by software. And so this leverage a whole new class of attacks that have been popular in the, in the past few years. So regarding, for example, the memory architecture, the speed of the, um, well, speed optimization in the CPU so that could help you uh, gather information about private keys and how they are manipulated. Uh, fault injections that will change the behavior of, uh, of the program running, currently running, so I could do a full presentation on that. So <laughs> just try to keep it short. And well, Summary is that if your operating system is compromised, usually people can find a way to extract the key. I mean, you can have uh, security in the middle, you can have trusted execution environment and so on. People will find creative ways to, to make you use the program in order to extract the key. Um, so here, malware are, still, mal malware are still super powerful. The lucky part is that usually you're not going to be targeted, but if you are specifically targeted, so spear phishing and, and so on, or if someone managed to infect uh, a popular wallet, then it's going, to be, it's going to be pretty bad. So what can a malware do? The easiest thing, I mean, other than stealing keys, a malware could be replacing a destination address because since addresses are hard to read, well, you could hijack the clipboard, for example. A uh, very famous way to do that is because the user experience, again, of paying invoices, for example, is not super uh, clear. So you don't have SSL with, uh, with, crypto, I mean, with crypto invoices. So you are just going to copy paste an address, a new address you just saw on your computer into your wallet to pay it. Uh, but if someone is hijacking the, cli the clipboard, in that case, you are going to send your money to the hacker instead of paying your invoice. So that's uh, a quite, I mean, that's why uh, clickjacking software are going to be uh, are super popular to steal crypto because it, it's an easy, I mean, it's an easy attack. Uh, 
Well, we have ways to make address easier to verify. So for example, on, on Ethereum, we have the ENS system, which is similar to DNS. So instead of manipulating addresses, so instead of manipulating IP addresses, you are going to manipulate uh, clear addresses. But well, of course, this is useful, but this is still limited because it's not fully connected to the DAP. So you are not clearly knowing that when you're interacting with a website, you're going to be interacting with the right decentralized application. Uh, it's vulnerable to the same problems that you have in Web2, so homo glyph attacks, for example. Uh, if people are using Unicode, they can masquerade as a, as, a, as a name that looks like the legitimate name, but is not it. And well, so it's a, it's a solution, I would say, but it's not it's not something perfect. It's just still better than interacting with uh, with addresses. But not everybody uh, is using that. So well, it's uh, it's a way, but it's not it's not it's not bu fully bulletproof. Um, so something else that malware or UI injection, as I mentioned earlier, can do. Well, the call um, that the DAP is doing can be replaced. So that was the example with Badger. So in that case. If you don't know what the application is doing, if your wallet is not displaying information about that, or if the call is slightly confusing, uh, you, are going to, you are going to approve something different. And if you approve something different, this can have consequences. So here, the example was just, OK, instead of getting a loan, for example, on the money market protocol, uh, you are going to send all your money to someone else just because you are calling a different function call of the same contract. So here, the hack is purely in the UI. The contract is not hacked, but you are still losing your money. Uh, so, um, a risk which is, in my opinion, the hardest to, the hardest to mitigate um, can be, well, if a smart contract can be updated um, and it's standing between a, a transparent proxy, so which means that the address is not going to change between different versions of the contract, then let's say that someone, someone so the attacker managed to get the management key that allow to update the contract. Um, the contract could be updated to a malicious version and you wouldn't be able to notice it. Uh, unless you have been watching the blockchain previously, you have been watching for those events, and you coach the update because uh, on, the user, on the user side, you're still interacting with the same contract. So you don't have a, way, a clear way to know what you are calling in the end. I mean, again, unless the wallet is performing some very deep uh, introspection of the consequences of your transaction, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to notice that. So uh, luckily, that's not something that has happened, I think, um, but it's still it's still something to be to think about and to be cautious about. I mean, just knowing that it can exist is uh, is nice. Um, so in the end, what do we need uh, to be to achieve a better level of protection and better security in Web3? So we need to protect keys from malware. So that's pretty clear. Uh, we need to verify what we are signing in a very flexible and open way. So the flexible and open way is super important because if we don't have this, uh, we will be limited to a set of application. And then, uh, you know, I mean, how users are usually behaving. I mean, they are jumping into the, the newest thing. And if you don't protect this accordingly, then, uh, well, your users, if you are a wallet developer, will be losing money. Um, so keys should be bound to uh, the most possible, um, the most flexible possible business logic in order to let you validate that. And well, problem is it's very hard to find good protection and a good way to verify your transaction and to protect key at the same time uh, with the current devices that are available. Um, so let's say if you can get a good protection for keys, but uh, business logic is not going to be super flexible or you're not going to get a secure display so you're not going to know that you are approving a transaction and not something that the malware is forcing you on uh, with a few set of technologies and other technologies you will get good key protection but then you will get the secure display but you don't you won't get the business logic uh, in that case you don't well you are trusting and you are trusting a component which is not secure in the middle and well so that's the reason why uh, we thought that it's useful to design specific devices to protect keys and display what the transaction is doing. So that's what we did. I mean, at, uh, at Ledger, uh, we are creating hardware wallets. So, as, uh, so that's, the, that's the only advertisement slide of the presentation. Don't worry. Uh, but this applies to a whole generic set of, uh, of uh, devices. So I don't feel I'm advertising too much. Um, so what makes us different from other hardware wallets? We are using smart cards. So we are using here a secure. We are using here smart card chip and. All the business logic is running into the smart card chip, which is itself connected to the screens and button, uh, meaning that the smart card chip can display, can perform all the validation of the transaction. The smart card chip can understand what the transaction is doing, and then display something to the user that 
could be as understandable as we want. So the idea is to be pretty close to something that a human can understand, uh, because just displaying what the transaction is doing from the protocol point of view is not enough. So that's the part where uh, that's the part that constantly needs to be improved, and well, that, that's pretty much what we are what we are trying to do. Um, so now going back into going back into into risks and specific risks related to NFTs. Um, so when you are transferring an NFT, it's a very it's a very simple function to it's a very simple function here that we are dealing with. So for example, which is called transfer from. Uh, but instead of saying that, I mean, instead of well having your wallet telling you that you are calling safe transfer from uh, and so on, uh, the wallet should tell you that you are going to transfer your ape uh, with ID number or something to another place. Uh, so that's what we wanted to implement. And this requires some extra logic on the wallet side because you need to understand what an NFT is. You need to understand, uh, you need to be able to associate um, the NFT um, address with the NFT name because users will be much more familiar with the NFT name, the collection name, uh, rather than the address of the NFT. And so that's some extra processing that needs to be done in a secure way because, again, uh, you don't want an attacker being able to change that because if you change that, you are back to square one uh, where someone could be could tell you that you are transferring the right NFT but sending another one. So you see that the problem is fairly complex, but in the end, you can have a good user experience when you are transferring NFT if you take care of that and if you manage to do it uh, securely and in a flexible way. Um, so something else related to, related to uh, NFTs and ERC721, um, which is again related to the way uh, Ethereum and EVM chains are working, is the approval patterns. Uh, when you need to interact with a contract, you are going first to approve your token to the contract and then call a function of the contract and the contract will decide to transfer your token. So you are not the one sending your token to the contract. And this leads to, well, this leads to a problem because that's a common way to interact with contracts, but this is not restricted to contracts. So let's say uh, you have an attacker forcing you to approve your tokens. It means that basically this attacker is going to be able to interact with all your tokens after that, and that you transfer ownership uh, of the tokens to the attacker. So while this is necessary for contracts, you should always verify that you are not sending an approval, you are not creating an approval to, well, to an address which is not a contract, and then that you are only approving to the right contract. So here the wallet can help with that, because the wallet can help, for example, could tell you that you are approving something that is not a contract address, and, well, flag this as a high risk, uh, because that's not, that's not something that you should do usually, I mean, the, but that's something that all attackers will do. Um, when you interact with a DAP, also here things get complicated. So with NFTs and uh, ERC721, why? Uh, because the flow can be the flow can be slightly different. Um, a common example to optimize gas here is OpenSea. So OpenSea is not performing on-chain transactions for bits. So when you are going to sell an NFT, when you are going to to create an offer. Uh, you are not doing that on-chain, you are doing that off-chain. So you are signing a message off-chain, which is a different transaction logic. So the wallet is not able to recognize that today. Uh, I don't think, I mean, there are many who, who, which are doing that. So here, if you end up signing an ERC, if you, are not, if you end up signing an EIP 712 uh, message, you will see here a lot of fields uh, that don't really make sense because you don't understand the protocol. And here again, uh, the wallet should be able to turn this into something that's understandable for you because just displaying what you're signing is not enough. I mean, unless uh, you know what is how to call cell kind and fee method, you're not going anywhere with this. Um, and regarding, no, let's see, let's say that you are creating content. So if you are creating content, uh, extra things to take uh, attention when you are creating your content, well, choosing the the right minting contract is important if you are minting an NFT, uh, because if you are not picking an open an open contract, I mean uh, a contract which is open source, you can have issues to uh, switch to another contract later, or the contract might not be as decentralized as you wish. Uh, so thinking about centralization when you create your content is always super important because uh, you will only put part of your content on chain. Usually, you will just put links uh, which are linking to other parts of the content, and where this open part, where this other part is is critical because uh, if you have if you end up with something that is on the blockchain but pointing to well content content that cannot be recovered uh, I would say that your well your content is pretty much uh, impossible to use after you did that because you have something on chain but it doesn't point to anything anymore 
Um, so here, of course, beware of centralized storage. Uh, even, well, when you consider decentralized, you have storage, you have several patterns uh, regarding that decentralization. So IPFS cannot, might not be able to solve all issues for you, and you have to think about how you are going to maintain your node, you are going to think about how you are going to, to update, I mean, if you need to. Uh, and well, when you are interacting with a smart contract, of course, uh, you have all the security risks that you've seen before. So when you are creating content, you can be vulnerable to some things that could, for example, uh, change your asset or change the name of your, change the name of the owner or anything. So well, uh, if you are a content creator, you have in fact uh, extra steps to perform on top of all the other steps uh, which are, which I described before. Um, one way to one way to add uh, an extra security layer to what you are doing is multi-signature. So multi-signature is quite popular in uh, on uh, um, on Ethereum VMs. Um, so it can be done uh, easily on Ethereum chain. So typically you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of DApps. I mean that allow you to do that. The most famous is probably Nosis Safe um, because it will uh, it will create all the all the multi-sig for you and with a good user interface and you can just go through the different steps. Uh, so, but multi-signature comes with extra pain regarding the user experience. So things will be things will be slower first. You still need to understand what you're signing uh, because of everything I mentioned before. Well, if you are multi if you are using a multi-signature but you don't understand what you're signing, you are still not understanding it. But with extra security steps, so not super useful. And it can it can lead to to extra cost if you are doing your multi signature on chain because then you have to interact with the smart contract when you are going to to perform the different either the different steps or the final steps but in the end it will always cost you more than just interacting with a um, with a with a single key directly. Um, now, if we look at if we look at other chains, uh, so I was just mentioning Tezos and Cosmos because they are they are famous, but I could I could be mentioning Solana as well. Uh, it's exactly the same problem. I mean, you are going to be interacting with contracts. You don't understand what you're signing. It's just slightly worse because you have less tooling. Um, so you have less tooling to understand the contract. You have less tooling to to with the wallets. I mean, because the wallets have been exposed to less risks, so they are not they are not taking all steps. I mean, to to give you to give you some information, and you don't have an easy multi-signature solution. So you're pretty much on your own regarding those those, those other chains. Um, but well, my take. I mean, my take. Speaking about all those risks, uh, would be to conclude saying that well, you. I think that we should have wallets uh, that understand that are more deeply integrated into uh, the flow of applications. Because in the end, I mean, the same way you don't need to understand, you don't need to understand how an engine works in order to drive. In the same way, you don't need to understand uh, how TCP works to be to be browsing the web. Uh, you should not need to understand everything I mentioned and all the stacks uh, to interact with Web3 securely. So we need wallets. Um, that are more deeply integrated into the application and will tell you what you are really doing. And those wallets should be able to, to secure keys as well because, well, that's their main, that, that their main function. But uh, I just wanted to mention that this function is not enough. So you need to be, UX is super important and the future of web free security will be going through the user experience. And so what we are doing uh, at Ledger to try to help with this, uh, we have started, so we are of course using an open source, uh, we are using open source frameworks to interact with our wallets. So everybody today can write a plugin for their smart contract. So we will provide, we are already providing, sorry, generic plugins, but that will just display you uh, the function calls that you are coding. So it might be useful if your DAP is very simple, but if your, if your DAP is more complex, you need some extra logic. Uh, if, for example, you are signing an EIP 712 uh, contract, then you need, again, to have some kind of plugin that will translate you uh, what you are signing into something more clear. So just to say, okay, with those three links, uh, we are providing ways for people to create their own user interface that will plug on top of the wallet and uh, try to try to make the try to make the user experience better for, for the different interactions. And with that, uh, I'm done. So if you have some more questions, I mean, you can reach me on Twitter, and we will be giving uh, I will be giving a surprise talk tomorrow to push a little bit further into this and uh, the future of the the future of the architecture as I as I can see it. So how we can push a bit further into the UX and well the different. Uh, other ideas, I would say, other ideas, but maybe a bit more abstract. Uh, so the, call, the talk will be on, uh, on the main stage around, around noon, I think, so it will probably be announced, but that's it. And
Thank you for attending. <laughs>
I think I think MetaMask is I think MetaMask is great when you are entering the space. Uh, I think it's going to get even better with uh, with Snaps. Uh, so they will be running their own plugin system, which will let you do things that are a bit similar to that and interact with uh, interact with other chains. Uh, as you said today, you can use Ledger with MetaMask because that's part of my that's part of my talk tomorrow. I would say okay, if you let, if you split the wallet into a lot of components, uh, in the end, hardware wallets are a bit like SIM cards. Uh, so you can consider that you can use I mean the signers that you plug into different wallets. So I definitely see us uh, interacting with MetaMask that way and let MetaMask uh, implement their own user experience if they want. And the same way, yes, we are going to launch our extension which will uh, match the user experience we want. So not saying that the MetaMask one is not good, but if you just want to interact with Ledger, for example, uh, it's better to have a plugin, it's better to have a Chrome extension that will just let you interact with your wallet instead of telling you, okay, you're going to create one account, then you are going to going to connect your hardware wallet and so on just because well it's a different I mean it's a different user experience so okay cool thank you uh, good morning C coming back to the, uh, the underlying asset of, of NST, NFT you, you mentioned also to to be aware uh, of the storage uh, is it centralized or uh, IPFS how how, uh, how would you recommend to have solutions to protect also the underlying asset, no, not only what's in the wallet, not only the private key. Oh, so you mean, the, the mean, you mean, so you mean the asset you are going to store into the, not into the chain? Yes. So when you're, when you're creating that, well, my, I mean, my personal advice regarding decentralization would, would be to use IPFS, but in a way where you are operating your own nodes and you are operating backups of your nodes on, uh, on another location. Um, so basically people should help you with your backups so that your content stays uh, pinned I mean, all the time, so you guarantee that you are not going to lose your content. Uh, but again, this might not be suitable for, for what you want because if, for example, you are going to have uh, content that you want to modify or stuff like this, then IPFS might not be the best choice, but I would say for most people, I, I would recommend doing that. So there should be... There should be a website, I mean, that help you doing that uh, in a completely, uh, in a completely, I mean, decentralized way, which is not the case today. So if you take stuff like uh, Pinata, for example, you are still depending on them to pin, so it's not ideal. Okay, thanks a lot for questions, and thank you, Nicola, for answering them. Yeah. Thank you.